All right, it is 10, a little bit after 10. So we will get started for today. And we just have a few slides um, that we have to go over from Monday's lecture uh, before we get into the new lecture. Um, just a reminder of what we covered on Monday, we were looking at our Lewis models and our Lewis structures. So first we just learned how to write our Lewis models. Then we learned how to use these Lewis models to create Lewis structures for ionic um, compounds. And then using that idea, we were able to predict in what ratio um, a metal and a non-metal would come together to form a neutral ionic compound. And so the last topic we're gonna to talk about for this PowerPoint is the idea of lattice energy. So let's, let's talk about this. So when you have a solid salt, the way that they interact is called a crystal lattice. Um, so if you've ever looked at like table salt underneath a microscope, um, or if you just put it really close to your eye, you'll see it's a, it's a crystal. And the way this crystal is um, interacting is that you have positive sodium right next to a negative chlorine. And I'm just going to use this central chlorine as an example. Around this chlorine, you have a bunch of positive sodium, like in every direction, because it's 3D. Then next to all these sodiums, you have chlorine. And it'll just continue out like that. And that's what this picture is showing here, where green is chlorine, purple is sodium. And that's what we're looking at when we look at a salt crystal. Now, the energy that holds this crystal together is lattice energy. And we can talk about, you know, what, what influences the strength of lattice energy. So one thing that's very important is the size of charge. By that, I mean like, are you a plus one ion or a plus two ion? And in general, the larger the charge you have, the stronger your lattice will hold together. So here we're comparing two different types of ionic crystals, sodium fluoride versus calcium oxide. So sodium fluoride are plus one and minus one. Calcium and oxygen are plus two, minus two. And because of that, the lattice energy of calcium oxide is roughly four times stronger than sodium fluoride. That means you have to put in four times as much energy to break apart a calcium oxide crystal then you do a sodium fluoride crystal. So that's one thing. The bigger your charge is, the stronger it is. The other thing is size. The bigger the atoms, the weaker the lattice energy. Um, because if atoms are small, they can come closer together. And according to Coulomb's law, that's a good thing. That's a favorable interaction. So the smaller the ion is a stronger lattice energy. However, as I have here, um, charge, the magnitude of the charge is usually more important than the size because here we're comparing, again, sodium fluoride to calcium oxide. Calcium oxide is bigger, right? The distance between the charges are 239. This is picometer. You don't really need to know what that means. Just know it's a distance. While sodium fluoride are 231 picometers. So sodium fluoride are smaller and they're closer together, but calcium oxide is much stronger because of their bigger charges. All right, so um, before we move on, are there any questions about the information presented here on lattice energies? Right. 
So what I want you to do is I want you to take out your periodic table and for these four um, ionic compounds, I want you to rank the lattice energies from low to high. So by low to high, I mean uh, weakest to strongest. So rank, rank these four compounds from weakness to strongest in terms of lattice energy. So I'll give you like a minute or so to do that. If you have questions, let me know. All right, so let's remember the two factors that determine lattice energy strength. You have to look at the charge and you have to look at the size. And re uh, remember charge is more important than size, right? So let's look at this, uh, the atoms here and using the skills that we have built all semester, um, hopefully, we're getting comfortable with knowing the charges on atoms, right? So oxygen and an ionic compound will always be minus two. Well, 99% of the time be minus two. So let's look at the charges of our metals then. So all of our metals are actually in the second column. So they're all going to be plus two. So our charges are the same. And all of these compounds were always mixing a plus two cation with a minus two anion. So lattice energy is not gonna be decided by that. And we have to rely on size. So this goes back to something we talked about like two weeks ago, um, the size of atoms, right? And if you remember for, um, neutral atoms, if you're in the same column, size uh, increases as you go down the periodic table. Uh, basically for neutral atoms, as you go to the bottom left, size generally incre increases. So our smallest um, um, metal here is magnesium. Therefore, it will have the strongest uh, uh, lattice energy. Because remember, the smaller you are, the closer your charges can come together. So if I'm um, ordering this from weak to strong, this would be my strongest, so I'll give it number four. My weakest 
would be uh, BAO, BAUV, because BA is the biggest atom out of the four metals we have. So the charges will be separated by the most distance, so that's my weakest. Now we have to decide between calcium and strontium. Calcium is above the periodic table over strontium, so calcium is smaller. So it will have a stronger lattice, whoops, I wrote that wrong. So it will have a stronger lattice energy than strontium. So from going weak to strong, uh, barium oxide is the weakest, followed by strontium oxide, calcium oxide, and magnesium oxide. And that has to do all on the sides of the atoms. Questions about lattice energies. All right. And then one more question, just to make sure we have this concept. Which has more negative and more negative means stronger. So negative energy is a good thing when we talk about energy. So the more negative you are, the stronger you are. So which one has more negative, KBR or uh, C-A-S-E. So I'm going to give people like 30 seconds to figure this out. Um, and if case you don't know where these elements are, we're talking about the fourth row on the periodic table. Element 19, element 35, element 20, element 34. So it'll take about 30 seconds and decide this. All right, so hopefully you came up with some kind of logic. So if we look at calcium, it's in the first column. So that forms a plus one ion. Bromine is with the halogens. So bromine's always minus one. I guess I'll write those a little higher. Plus one, minus one. Calcium is in the second column. So that's plus two. Selenium is in the same column as oxygen, so it's going to be a minus two. Therefore, the ionic compound with the more negative lattice energy is going to be the one with the greater charge. Plus two and a minus two interact more strongly, therefore more negative than a plus one or a minus one ion. And that should wrap up our discussion on lattice energies and for the time being wrap up our discussion on ionic bonds. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm gonna go to our next PowerPoint here. The PowerPoint I put up for today. And what we're talking about uh, for today is we're now going to look at Lewis structures for covalent compounds and for polyatomic ions, right? And making these Lewis structures, it's, it's more difficult than the ionic compounds. But there is a, a set of like, uh, steps you can follow to make this simpler for you. So let's look at how to write the Lewis structure for like any atom, any, any molecule. One, you have to write the correct, what I'm calling skeletal structure for the molecule. 
So what I mean by that is, let's say I asked you to write out CH4. The first thing you wanna do is just position the atoms correctly. And some hints for this is that if you have a hydrogen, hydrogen can only be bond, bonded to one thing. So that's why it says hydrogens are always terminal, never central. So they have to be like an endpoint. Um, any electronegative atoms, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, probably today. What an electronegative atom is, is it's an atom that really wants electrons. So think of like your halogens. Think of the atoms that become negative during a chemical reaction. Those are electronegative atoms. Those will also be at terminal positions. They don't like to be bonded more than one thing either. Um, carbon, carbon's like always in the center of things. Um, but this, this right in the structure, um, it just kind of takes some practice to look at molecules and understand you know, what's at terminal and, and what's not terminal. And we're gonna do some practice with that to make it a little more comfortable for us. So that's our first step, write, write the uh, skeletal structure. Two, calculate the total number of electrons by summing the valence electrons in, the mo in each atom. All right, and if you're an ion, make sure you are aware of the charge. So going back to our model, CH4, um, and going back to the skills we learned like two weeks ago, how to count valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron. And since we have four hydrogens, we have four valence electrons coming from all of our hydrogens. We have one carbon, and carbon's uh, electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So the highest energy level is the second, which means we have four valence electrons. So in total, the number of valence electrons we have in this example problem is eight. For CH4, we have eight valence electrons. So that's step two, just count the number of valence electrons. Step three, start giving these electrons out to atoms and do your best to um, make it an octet. Whoops, that is to make sure everything has eight electrons surrounding it. Or if it's hydrogen, make sure you only have two electrons surrounding it. So let me give out my skeletal structure here. So the rule is I have eight electrons to place and I need to make sure a hydrogen has two electrons and carbon has eight. So let's just start. I'm gonna put two electrons here which means I have six more electrons to place, but this hydrogen's good because it has two electrons in a covalent bond. So it is sharing two electrons. So I do the same thing to this hydrogen. Right now I have four valence electrons to place. This hydrogen has two electrons around it. It's good. Do that again. Okay. Now I have two more valence electrons to place. That hydrogen's also good. So I place my last two valence electrons. I have no more valence electrons to place, but each hydrogen now has two electrons associated with it. So each hydrogen is satisfied. Now let's see for uh, carbon. Carbon has two, four, six, eight electrons around it as well. So carbon is satisfied because it made an octet. So the molecule of CH4 using lines set of dots looks like that. Now there will be occasions 
ions, when you're placing electrons and you can't form an octet with the amount of electrons you have, in that case, we'll have to make double bonds and triple bonds. Um, and we'll, we'll practice all of that. But before we actually get into some examples, is there any questions about what I did here so far? All right, so let's, let's, let's try this. So I have four Lewis structures here and I will do A for us just as another example and then let you do B, C, and D. And what I'll probably do for each of those, I'll probably give you like two minutes and then I'll come back and do it and then give you another two minutes, come back and do it. Um, but let's do SCL to, uh, together. Step one, write the skeletal structure. Usually, if you have uh, one atom and multiple copies of a second atom, usually the one atom is in the center and the multiple copies are on the termini. So for SCL2, S is most likely to be in the center. CL will be on each side of S. So keep that in mind like for NF3, usually the N is probably gonna be in the center. So SL2, S is in the center. So step two, determine how many valence electrons each molecule has. So chlorine, <coughs> excuse me, each chlorine has seven valence electrons because chlorine is um, neon, 3s2, 3p5. Sulfur has six valence electrons because sulfur, that was chlorine, that's sulfur, is neon, 3s2, 3p4. And I'm gonna do something a little different than what I did um, previously. Um, I should have done this for CH4, um, but what you should do once you have these valence electrons, write the Lewis structures, right? So chlorine, the Lewis structure, if you remember, would look like that. I'm gonna do the same thing over here for chlorine. For sulfur, I'm gonna do that, that, and here. So six electrons, whoops, did not mean to make that smiley face. Uh, six electrons around sulfur currently, seven around chlorine, seven around chlorine. And the idea here is I want everything to have eight electrons around it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a covalent bond. When I make a covalent bond, these, add, these electrons are now shared between the chlorine and the sulfur. So chlorine now has eight electrons. So basically every time you make a covalent bond, you add one electron to each atom that the bond was created for. So chlorine went from seven to eight, sulfur went from six to seven. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I'm gonna make a covalent bond. When I do that, each atom gained an electron because they're sharing now. Sulfur is eight, chlorine is eight. So my structure, I'll just rewrite it to be a little more neat. That is my Lewis structure for uh, SCL2. See if you can follow that for NF three. Like I said, I'll give you like two minutes um, and then I'll come back and help you solve it um, if you're stuck. But if you have questions, um, please do let me know.
So question, we need to add those covalent bond lines in between the atoms rather than putting the dots next to each other to show that sharing. Um, you don't, it just makes it a lot easier to see. Um, so I would, I would uh, recommend that you do it to just make sure it's not in, ambiguous at all. But if you do look online, for example, for uh, Cl, uh, S, Cl2, you will see some people write it out like that. And it's acceptable to do it. I just personally like the lines because I think it's easier to see. All right, so that's been two minutes, 30 seconds. So let's look at NF3. So first thing is the skeleton. And it's by itself, so I'm just going to put F around the ends. And then valence electrons. Uh, nitrogen has five valence electrons. So let's do that. One, two, three, four, five. Fluorine each has seven. Two, four, six, seven. Two, four, six, seven two, four, six, seven, 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 and then five. Remember, the name of the game is to get to eight for everything. So make a covalent bond. When I do that, the things that have that covalent bond each increase by one. So fluorine's good. Seven, fluorine's good. Fluorine and nitrogen are good. So that is what this molecule looks like. And then it has a bunch of other dots right there. So that is NF3. All right. So I'm going to do the same thing here and give you like uh, an extra minute or two. Uh, now that you've seen um, a couple of examples, try to do CF3 NH2. A hint. The molecule as written like this is written in such a way that is trying to tell you how all the atoms are lined up. Let's see if you can figure that out. All right, so let's do C. H is only trying to get two right. Yep, hydrogen only wants two electrons. Hydrogen does not want eight. So CH3 and H2. The first thing is our skeleton. Carbon, 
almost always in the middle. You'll never put carbon at a termini. Hydrogen, always at the termini, followed by nitrogen. Then hydrogen, always at the termini. Right. So again, the rules to keep in mind, hydrogen only wants to ever be in one covalent bond. It only wants to bind one thing. It never wants to bind multiple things. So that's why it's always at the termini. That's roughly what the structure looks like. And now let's put our valence electrons. Hydrogen only gets one valence electron. Carbon gets four. And I'm gonna do it weird like that, um, which is different than what we talked about on Monday. Um, but I'm gonna do it like that because carbon, um, just, just as a hint, when you're working with carbon and doing the Lewis symbol, I often find it easier to go like this because carbon loves the bond stuff. Um, it's what carbon does. So I just like to open them up for um, bonding possibilities like that. Nitrogen has five, like we talked about on B. So I'm just gonna connect all my lines. So each hydrogen has two electrons. So they're all good. This carbon has eight. And then this nitrogen has two, four, six, then left over, eight. So if I'm gonna write this little meter, well, not that much neat, but that is CH3 and H2. So the last one um, is CFCl3. So again, I'll give you like a minute or two to uh, work on that. And then I will uh, go over that one as well. Okay, I'm gonna clear all this so um, we can do D now, have some space. So D, same idea, carbon gonna be in the center. Halogen, so this is another tip. Any halogen is always like gonna be terminal. So F and then three CLs. Carbon has four, halogens get seven. So I'm going to put them, put seven around. Then start making my covalent bonds. Carbon, eight. Now all these have eight. Whoops. 
Hey, hey, hey. Everything's happy. And that is how we can figure out how to do Lewis structures for any single molecule in chemistry. Questions about uh, that exercise? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I put the F on the far right of C rather than the top of C like you did. Yeah, it does you can put that uh, flooring in any position. It does not matter at all. Correct. We do not have enough information to know where the flooring goes. All right. Now let's get to this idea of electronegativity that uh, we talked about like on the very first slide for this, um, this new PowerPoint. And electronegativity, like I said, is how bad a, an atom wants an electron. And for the periodic table, the trend is uh, it goes from the bottom left here to the top right. So fluorine is your most uh, electronegative atom. It wants electrons the most out of any atom on the periodic table. Francium, which is on the bottom left, is your least electronegative atom. It does not want electrons at all. So that's, that's what these numbers mean. The higher the number, the more you want an electron. And when two atoms come together to form a bond, yeah. Based on their differences in electronegativity, we can determine what type of bond they will form. So if the atoms have the same electronegative number, they are in what's called a pure covalent. They share their electrons 100% equally. If you're from 0.1 to 0.4 difference, then this is what's called nonpolar covalent where you form a covalent bond and you share your electrons pretty, pretty equally in that when we look at the atoms, there's no difference. Like we don't see one atom as being minus one atom being plus. However, if the electronegativity ranges from 0.4 to 1.9, the difference in electronegativity that is, then you start getting in a polar covalent. And the best example for this is water that um, you might have learned about in high school chemistry, if you took high school chemistry. So water is bound like this, right? The electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5 and the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. So to find out what type of bond we're gonna form, we just subtract these two numbers and the difference is 1.4, which means this is a polar covalent type of bond. And in polar covalent, one, one atom is gonna be partially negative, which we give this symbol, That's, that is partial, partial charge symbol. So when you're polar, one atom is going to be partially negative. One's going to be partially positive because the more electronegative atom is like stealing electrons. They're, they're an electron hog. They don't share them that well. They're still sharing, but like unequal sharing. And the atom with the higher electronegative value, we're going to say that it has a partial negative charge. So on oxygen, shares the electrons more, they get more of the electrons than hydrogen, so they have a somewhat negative charge. Well, poor hydrogen does not get as many as electrons as oxygen, so we say that as a partial positive charge. So that's a polar bond. And then if the difference in electronegativity scores is greater than two, you have formed an ionic bond. So let's look at lithium fluoride. 
something to do, do that down here. So lithium fluoride, when they come together, lithium has a score of one, fluorine has a score of four, four minus one equals three, that's greater than two, which means you're gonna form an ionic bond where lithium gives the electron to fluorine. And this is stuff we've all talked about already. Um, we have a metal and a non-metal. Metals lose electrons, non-metals gain them. This is just another way to understand that concept through electronegativity scores. All right, so any questions about that? Right. So I want you then for these five compounds to tell me what type of bond you're going to form. Nonpolar, polar, or ionic. And the, and the ionics. Uh, I'm just rewriting what's being cut off at the bottom. So if you're greater than two, you're ionic. If you're a polar compound, show me which way the uh, electrons will flow. To do that, you use an arrow like this, where the arrowhead goes to the negative atom, and this, uh, the, the cross here goes towards the uh, positive atom. So I'll just do A. So we have carbon and nitrogen. Carbon's 2.5, nitrogen is three. So that has a difference of 0.5, which makes us polar. Since it's polar, I have to draw this arrow in the correct orientation. And the arrowhead always goes towards the more electronegative atom. So nitrogen would be partially negative, carbon would be partially positive. So using that table on the right, see if you can figure out uh, B, C, D, and E for me. Uh, let me know if you have questions. All right, since time's running out, let me go through these. Um, so B, bromine, bromine. Bromine has a score of 2.8. The other bromine has a score of 2.8. 2.8 minus 2.8 is zero. So this is covalent. Pure covalent. Um, usually we just say uh, nonpolar. No arrow because there, this is not a polar bond. So you don't draw an arrow for BRBR. BR. CCL, carbon 2.5, chlorine 3.0. The difference between those two is 0.5. Um, and this is something that usually comes up. 
you can never have a negative score uh, difference in electronegativities. Just take the absolute value. Just get the positive value every single time. So the difference between carbon and chlorine is 0.5. So this is polar covalent. And to draw our arrowhead, we just draw towards the more negative atom, which is chlorine. Carbon and sulfur, carbon's 2.5, sulfur's 2.5. That is nonpolar or pure covalent. Then we have strontium, uh, that is 1.0. Oxygen is 3.5, which is a difference of 2.5, which means this is ionic. And we don't draw the arrow for ionic compounds either. The arrow is only for polar compounds, and it's just showing you which one is more negative and which one's more positive. So questions about using electronegativities to determine what type of bonds we're going to form between molecules. All right. So um, this last question, what I think I'm going to do, because all the last question is, is a bunch of Lewis structures. So I think um, I will do like B on um, Friday, because we haven't, I haven't shown you any examples of like negative, I'll do A and B on um, um, Friday. because both A and B are examples of Lewis structures we haven't made yet. So I wanna show you how to do that. But um, depending on our time frame, I might just say C through G um, to do on your own and then I'll put up the answers. Um, but yeah, that's just to let you know um, what the plans are in the future. Um, otherwise, we, we are out of time. So thank you for stopping by. Thank you for watching YouTube. Um, be sure to like, comment and subscribe all that good jazz. Um, doesn't actually matter. I turn off comments anyway, so you can't do that. Um, but yeah, I'll put up a homework for you. Um, if you have questions on any of this, if you need more help, um, you want tutoring sessions, please let me know. Uh, I am super available, especially at the wrap up of the semester. Um, otherwise, hope you have a good rest of your Wednesday. Hopefully I will see you soon. Take care.